Okay, you're good to go, Marnie. Oh, great. Oh, uh, just setting up. Oh, getting my background set up, and I'll wait a minute till it is exactly the hour. Uh, welcome, everyone. Okay. It is noon Eastern time. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on meeting the moment strategies for contributing to a broad conversation on genetics and society. This is the fourth joint webinar organized by the Genetic Society of America and the Personal Genetics Education Project or PG Ed for short. Uh, my name is Marnie Gelbart. I'm the Director of Programs at PG Ed. We operate out of the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's session on discussing genome editing and the environment. We will be talking about controversial topics that raise a host of ethical questions. We ask that everyone is respectful and kind with the presenters and your fellow participants. The Genetic Society of America has a code of conduct for all its online events. The link is on the slide here. I don't anticipate we'll have any issues, but GSA staff will remove anyone who is disrupting the workshop. And we will be recording PG Ed's presentation today so we can share it with those who could not make it to the webinar. We take privacy very seriously and our intention is to record the presenters, but not any participants. So if by chance we make a mistake and the participants are in the recording, that piece will be edited out before we share the video online. Okay. Um, the goal of the session today is to share tools that PG Ed has developed to engage people in conversations about genome editing and the environment and to share discussion discussion strategies that we've used to create a space where pe people can both learn but also share their experiences and their viewpoints. I'm joined today by three of my colleagues at PG Ed. For those of you who have been to a few of these, you're starting to recognize us. Um, Nadine Vincentin, Dana Waring, and Robin Bowman. Um, everything we'll be presenting is builds on the work of our former team, team members and on the lessons that PG Ed has learned from the past 15 years um, from the people who have been kind enough to share their time with us for a conversation about genetics. So here is an outline for today's session. So for the next hour until 1 p.m. Eastern time, um, we'll use a standard webinar format. We'll hear a presentation from Nadine and Dana um, will chime in as well. And then we'll reserve the last 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we ask that you keep your microphone muted and please use the chat box for questions and comments throughout the hour. Robin will be keeping an eye on the chat. Thank you, Robin. Um, we've also reserved an extra 30 minutes at the end for informal conversation and more questions with the PG Ed team. Um, in our last webinar, a bunch of people stayed around and chatted with us or they listened in. And so um, this is optional. Um, you're welcome to stay and mute yourself at that point between 1 and 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we know that some of you come to webinars to listen and learn. Some of you would really like to have a space for small group discussions. Um, and Nadine will share information at the end about how to join the Slack group that PG Ed and GSA have started to keep the conversation going. Um, and we welcome your feedback on, on how our programming can help to meet your needs. Um, okay, so today we are talking about genetic engineering and the environment because of the profound potential of new tools such as CRISPR to transform our planet. And I just wanted to start out by sharing with you a sampling of the stories that have been on PGS radar recently um, about applications that are intersecting with people's lives. So genetic engineering and environmental concerns um, have been on the ballots in the United States. And after years of debate related to safety and public opinions, early, earlier this month marked the first release of mosquitoes in the US to curb populations um, with, with the goal of preventing mosquito-borne diseases. Recent use of cells pre preserved in a frozen zoo designed to preserve genetic diversity of endangered animals has resulted in the birth of the first cloned endangered species of North America, uh, Elizabeth Ann, the black-footed ferret. 
Um, there's also, oops, I'm forgetting where, where I am controlling my slides from. Um, so there's also been genetic engineering in pig cells designed to lack the alpha-gal sugar on the surface of cells um, so that these pigs can now be a food source for people with certain allergies that are triggered um, by tick bites. Um, and they're cleared for clinical trials related to the use of heparin, which is a common blood thinner, um, as well as organ transplantation. Scientists are researching if genome editing can be a tool to combat the impacts of climate change, including questions about resilient crops, virus and pest resistance, and developing plants tolerant of suboptimal environmental conditions. And in particular, this article about um, Professor Joanne Chori grabbed our attention for today because we were inspired by the story of her decision to revamp her research program and harness genetic tools with the aim of creating new approaches to climate change. This is like 100% the kind of article that PG Ed would ask students to read ahead of our visit to get their creative ideas flowing. For communities to reap the benefit from new generations of gene edited crops, a lot of work is of course needed outside the laboratory. Um, scientists from Ghana, Nigeria, and elsewhere in Africa highlighting the need in, a, in this article for advocacy across government and non-governmental organizations to address potentially exclusionary GMO regulatory frameworks and the lack of investment in re research infrastructure so that so that advances in the science are accompanied by developments in policy and um, public spaces. And um, final example I'll show here as research moves forward on gene drives, how are scientists creating opportunities and addressing challenges to engage, engage with communities that will be impacted by their work? And specifically, how can they co-create that research with all the stakeholders at the table? So, Clearly there's, there's a lot going on, it's gonna keep on coming. And we are here today as a genetics community because we recognize that we have a responsibility because we hope that the science coming out of our labs will help people, it'll be used equitably and safely. And because we are humble that we do not have all the answers. And as we aspire to meet this moment, what is the path forward? For a work of this magnitude, surely there's not one answer um, and we continue to hear from you since we've launched this initiative about your personal missions for meeting this moment. Some of you are here to learn PG Ed's approach, which is centered on education and dialogue that's inclusive of as many people as possible. We know that some of you are here because you're committed to preparing the next generation of scientists in your undergrad and advanced biology classes. Some of you are focused on increasing representation in research. So historically marginalized peoples are included as research participants, but also as researchers having a seat at the table where decisions are made and the power to direct what happens next. Some of you are focused on advocacy and activism to affect political change. And some of you may not still be quite sure yet what your path is, but you're hungry to move beyond talk and find ways to take action. We may have distinct missions that drive us as individuals, um, but the principles that guide us in our work are overlapping. And so whatever has brought you here today, I believe that PG Ed has something valuable to offer you as we share our approach for engaging with people on genetics. PG Ed, we strive to meet people where they are, whether they're in classrooms, community spaces, places of worship, in government, at home watching TV, in a movie theater, or online. And the crux of the approach is one that surprised me when I first started at PG Ed. Um, we talk about genetics in an accurate and nuanced way, but also in an accessible way that centers on people, where a lot of the nuts and bolts of the science have been stripped away. Um, and we talk about genetics without any hint of advocacy for or against the use of genetic tools. Um, we are, we are really always thinking about starting points. How do we start the conversation, especially with people from communities that scientists have traditionally failed to engage? Even if someone has shown up to an event we're holding, it does not mean that their mind is open to what we have to say. And we've learned from our collaborators that they often experience researchers as people who show up, say nice things, ask for something, take what we need and then leave whether the ask is for a blood sample or a survey that checks a box for our next grant. Why should we expect them um, 
or why should they expect that we have anything to say that's relevant for them? For some people, the topic of genetics is a barrier. If you don't have the academic credentials to talk about genetics, you might wonder if you even belong in that room or whether we will speak in a language that is accessible to you. And amid the many divides in our world today, people have plenty of reason to be concerned that they might be judged based on where they live, how they speak or what they believe. The responsibility is on us to put in the work to lower all of these barriers. Um, PG Ed does not pretend to have all the answers, but in our experience, the best way um, is to lower these barriers is through conversation. Conversation that invites people in to express their opinion, to ask questions, and to share the expertise they bring from their life experiences. Conversation can be scary. We are giving up control. Personally, I love control. We cannot pre-plan for everything, and as a result, sometimes we make mistakes. Mistakes come with the territory, and all of this can be uncomfortable to walk into. So why do we do it? And really it's because the absence of conversation is even scarier and because it works. Time and time again, we've seen success with this approach. Feedback like the quotes from some of our workshops on this slide. Uh, people's curiosity is sparked. They realize that we care about them, that we respect them as people. They see themselves in conversation about science. They see that they have something to contribute and that we are learning from them. So part of what resonates um, with people about our curriculum is that our lessons are dynamic and responsive. Inclusion is not a one and done thing. It's an ongoing process and our lessons are very much living and breathing documents. Five years ago, we were hiring for a new position on our, on our team and in one of the interviews, a candidate named Florcy Romero told us, you know, you talk about really important issues related to genetics that no one in my community knows about. No one even taught me about genetics in my high school. Your curriculum is great, but it's a really white curriculum. And when Florcy joined our team, our work benefited enormously from her willingness to bring her expertise and perspectives as a social scientist and activist and an indigenous and Latinx woman. She started on a project to create a lesson on genetics and the environment. Our first idea was a lesson about the scientific stories which crops are candidates for CRISPR and why? What are the scientific challenges that are being addressed by gene drives? But Florcy asked a question that shifted the foundation of the lesson we're about to share with you. She asked, who are the indigenous people presently or formerly living on the land where this work is being considered? And working with Nadine who brought the science piece, Florcy shifted the entire gaze of this lesson. As you'll hear from Nadine, it's a lesson that puts the problems that genetics are trying to solve into the social context of colonialism. It focuses on the cultural significance of a bird in Hawaii and provides an opportunity for students who are native Hawaiian to see their culture reflected in the curriculum, a culture that has withstood and resisted massive efforts to erase it. And a lesson that broadens the definition of expertise and asks students to consider whose voice is needed at the table. Dana will chime in with some moments where we realized the impact that Florcy's efforts had on the people we were with. Um, so before I um, pass the baton over to Nadine, I just share some of the resources that Nadine is drawing from today. Um, you can download all of these from our website. Um, I'll ask Robin to um, pop these into the chat. And with that, I'll turn things over to Nadine. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, let me just make sure I share my screen. Where am I? Okay, so hopefully this is all working fine. If not, I'm sure somebody will let me know. <laughs> all right, so my aim for today is to kind of talk about our lesson really from a perspective of like our thoughts behind the materials as well as some of the strategies we use to have these conversations, these discussions that Marnie introduced um, earlier on. Um, there's a lot of content when it comes to these lessons. Our lesson plans are 
uh, pretty thick, so to speak, when it comes to that. And I'll, I'll touch upon that a couple of times throughout. But for the full picture, the full content, again, the links that um, are up in chat that will link you to the lesson, um, please find the full slideshow, the full PDF, um, all the materials there. And so really, as Marnie introduced, the idea behind this lesson is to think about, you know, as she said, we really started with like, what are the scientific stories? What are the, the new technologies out there that link um, genome editing to our environment, right? PGET's really interested in like, where does genetics meet society? And this felt like, I mean, as you saw from the headlines that Marnie shared, it's a really current topic of mosquitoes right now being released in Florida, ge uh, genetically modified mosquitoes to combat um, various diseases that they spread there. And so it's really like where genetics comes into society. And like Marnie said, the focus initially was very much on kind of the science, what are the projects, what are the questions? And with Florcy's input, this lesson really shifted to put science as part of the story rather than leaving the story is like part of the full narrative and a more holistic approach to how science interacts with society, the ethical questions and things like that. And so I want to highlight some of that as well, some of the strategies we use to have these conversations with the people that we're with. And so as a first, if my slides want to progress, there we go. Kind of a first strategy. Um, this is something we start many of our workshops with or when we're with students, teachers, communities. Um, this is strategy you can call classroom agreements, community agreements, ground rules whatever name you feel would be appropriate um, for the people you're with. And it's really about creating what we call a brave space, uh, intentionally shaped by and inclusive of all identities and social groups and encourages equitable, par equitable participation. So in a nutshell, it's about how do we create a space where people feel comfortable to speak up, like these barriers that Marnie mentioned before, people might feel hesitant, like I don't know enough or people don't wanna hear my voice. Creating these agreements at the start is both a way to make some agreements on how we're going to have these discussions and I'll show some samples in a minute, but it also shows uh, it, the aim is also to show like we are willing to create this space for everybody to speak up and we invite you to be part of the conversation. So just to give you some examples um, of agreements that often come up quite naturally speak from your own experience as we're having the conversation. Realize impact can be different than intent, but do own the impact of your words. Listen to understand, not to respond. The focus should be on learning, not on debating. You don't have to agree, uh, but you must be civil. Criti critique ideas, not the people. And it's okay to change your mind. You, you might think one way at the start of conversation and it's fine to change your perspective over time as you hear other people's thoughts. Share the floor, pass the mic, step up, step back. Challenge by choice, each individual can choose if or when to participate. So this is just to give you some initial guidelines on this. Um, very often these kind of very naturally come up. The image actually in this um, earlier slide is from when we did this at a workshop for, with teachers. In this case, we asked them like, what are some agreements you can think of? And we jotted them down as we went along. This was clearly an, uh, before pandemic in-person workshop. Um, so that's one way of doing it. You can come to it as a group, which is a really, um, I think, powerful thing to do. But it's also fine if you feel it works better for the people you're with to just kind of maybe have a slide like this up and say, these are the agreements we're gonna work with. Or maybe just something to have in your head, not necessarily something you share at the start, but just as you're having conversations, you can draw from this as you're trying to clarify to people like, okay, if the discussion goes in certain ways or a certain atmosphere is created, these are some key points you can um, hand at that moment to kind of guide the conversation. Okay, so with that, let's dive into the actual lesson on like how does genome editing or how can it impact our environment? And the way we've set up this lesson, it's really three case studies that all kind of have the same layout of introducing a problem at hand, looking at uh, genetic technology, specifically focus on genome editing here, that has been suggested to aid solving this problem, and then some concerns and questions about the, uh, that picture. And so as you can see, we have three case study. One is on cassava, the other one on Hawaiian honeycreepers, and the third one is um, on woolly mammoths. Um, so again, like I mentioned at the start, I won't go too deep in all the content that we have in the interest of time. I wanna focus more on kind of strategies and our thoughts behind the lesson. 
And because of that, I'll also focus on two out of these three, the cassava and the honey pupa case study. Um, but I will don't want to just completely skip the mammoth case study because there's kind of a, an interesting point to make there, which especially when I talk with scientists about these materials and the mammoth example comes, it's like, oh, that sounds very far-fetched and very out there, which in at scientific level is a way to think about that, right? Because both genome ending of crops, genome ending of mosquitoes, and uh, which is the story of the Hawaiian honey creeper, are all kinds of technologies that are either already there or very close to being ready to be put out in the world. When it comes to using genome editing to bring back, for example, woolly mammoth or other extinct species, this is still a bit further away. Um, but the reason we include this and, and the kind of the bigger picture I wanna bring here, thinking about communicating genetics to different audiences is the idea of storytelling, the idea of finding the hook, finding that narrative that's gonna draw people in like if I say, if I start somewhere, I say, oh, we're going to talk about genome editing and the environment to this crowd that I'm talking to today, that might sound super interesting to a lot of people they will be like, what is genome editing? Why should I care? It might sound like a lot of fancy words that they're just not, it doesn't grasp their attention. When I say we're going to talk about woolly mammoths and potentially bringing them back to life, that grabs people's attention. Um, actually, when we were working on this list and creating it, Boston public schools were reading the book Wooly at the time. So there really was that hook there of like, this is something that especially middle schoolers, but high schools, actually any audience, they really get intrigued and interested in, and it's getting them there to then talk about the underlying science, the social questions, the ethical questions. Um, and so that's why I just kind of a message I broadly want you to think about when you're thinking about communicating your science, like find that story, find that question that resonates with the people that you're talking with. Um, to kind of get them on, on board. And so this lesson, as I mentioned, consists of several case studies. Um, um, and as I'll try to emphasize throughout, we really design our materials so that you could either present them as they are and ready to go, but we definitely encourage people to adjust them to their community, the people they're talking to, the students you're talking to. So what do you want to present this whole lesson is one you can or you can pull out single case studies because they might fit with other material you're talking about that's um all part of the fun and part of the game and so let's move on to the first case study that we have in this lesson which is on cassava and so for those of you who've, who've been with some of our webinars before you will recognize our do nows our discussions at the very start of every lesson at, and in this case it's at the start of every single one of those case studies we have what we call a do now or a discussion which is really again when we're thinking about lowering barriers getting people engaged we start with conversation right from the start to encourage people first of all to get engaged to hear their voices to let them know that we want to hear their voices but to also Low this barrier of like, oh, I need to be an expert on this. I need to have, know everything about the genetics, everything about cassava, everything about what's happening I have to be part of the conversation. Um, you really don't. And what we're trying to do here is like this information that's here on the slide, right? You live in a rural village and your relatives are suffering from Konzo, a disease that causes paralysis. You rely on a plant called cassava as your main source of food. Cassava naturally produces a toxin and at high concentration, this toxin can make people sick with Konzo However, soaking the cassava in water for a couple of days before eating it prevents this problem. Scientists have proposed to genetically alter the cassava plant to make it less dangerous. You wonder whether providing a clean source of water, such as a well to your village, could be a better solution. What are the questions you have for the scientists about their plan? So it's really about putting the people that you're with in the shoes of this uh, villager in this case, that scientists are coming to them saying, we have a solution for the problem we see here what are questions you have? Let's get the conversation started. So what is kind of then, what, what are we talking about in this case study? So cassava is a food crop that is important to millions of people worldwide. Uh, as you can see from the images here, people from South America to Africa to Asia, it's a very common food crop. But even in North America, Europe, um, across the world really, cassava is, um, is being eaten. You might know it as um, tapioca starch. Uh, a lot of students actually are familiar with the tapioca pearls, which are these bubbles in boba tea or bubble tea. That is a cassava product. So just to kind of link it to like, 
many people are familiar with this. And one of the reasons for its, its popularity across the world is it's actually very drought tolerant. So it can grow well in dry conditions where many other crops uh, wouldn't survive. So what is the problem at hand, so to speak? So cassava, as we saw from the dunok, can cause a disease called conso. So cassava naturally produces a toxin, which is present at higher levels when the plant is grown in drought conditions. So the drier the conditions, the more of this chemical it produces. And when you get that um, uh, chemical at high levels into your body, it can cause a disease called conso that leads to paralysis and can potentially be deadly. Now, if you soak the cassava in water and eat it as part of a protein-rich diet, this kind of prevents conso and makes cassava a, source, a safe source of food, which is just for millions of people around the world. And so at this point, you might wonder if, you know, if you look at this, the solution seems pretty simple, right? You process the cassava properly, soaking it in water for a couple of days, um, eating as part of a protein-rich diet, it really is safe to eat. So why is conso an issue? And so Konzo is actually found in those regions in the world that um, particularly in certain countries in Africa with a history of European colonialism. And because of that history, those countries are left in extreme poverty or a lot of people in those countries are left in extreme poverty. And it's that extreme poverty that means they don't have access to, for example, a clean source of water to soak the cassava, or they don't have access to a protein rich diet. For some of these people, cassava is their main source of food and there is not much else there. And so really when we think about Konzo, a way to think about it is that it is a disease of poverty because it's poverty that limits that access to water and protein rich diet, which could, which could basically negate the toxic effects of this um, food source. So that's kind of the description of, in a nutshell, very much of the problem at hand. In our teaching documents, the PDF, the slide notes, we'll have more resources both on the background of cassava, the history of uh, how that, the history of European colonialism adds to the picture of Konzo. Again, like I said, it's all about adapting the lesson to the people you're with. Today, I have a limited amount of time, so we're going to these key points, but if I had more time, we would talk about this in more detail. And you can really go um, more in depth with that. And so now that we've established a problem in this case, so then the next is kind of like, what is the genome editing technology that has been suggested to aid solving this problem of Konzo? And so what has been suggested is that there's basically two genes in cassava that are responsible for the plant's toxic effects. And CRISPR or genome editing broadly could be used to edit these genes to reduce the toxicity of cassava. Now this is where if I'm talking to maybe a middle school classroom, certain high school classrooms, um, a library event, my family at home, this is probably the level of science where I might stop and just say, okay, let's get an, uh, generally this presentation has a slide to define what genome editing is and that CRISPR is a tool to do genome editing. So we give them that much of information. But that's where I often stop, or at least that's where I start. And then I might add on if, the conversation goes there. Obviously, different communities, different groups of people, you want to maybe go more in depth on the science. And so our genome editing and CRISPR lesson is kind of a sister lesson to this one, has more information, for example, on how CRISPR itself works. Um, we have a science supplement in there that talks about like the Cas9 enzyme and goes more into that depth. There's definitely resources, different a variety of resources there that will discuss the science in more detail if that's what you would like to do. In this lesson, if you actually go to the slide note for this specific slide, it will talk about um, like what do these genes produce? They produce um, cyanogenic glucosides that are, when they get into the human body, can turn be turned into cyanide, which is causing the toxic effect. Um, it, for example, talks also about that the people that are working on this idea of um, genome editing cassava to combat their toxicity are also working on a technique called um, DNA-free CRISPR or transgene-free CRISPR, where basically what they're trying to develop is a method where they can do CRISPR without introducing quote-unquote foreign DNA into the cassava plant to circumvent certain GMO regulations in countries where if there would be foreign DNA, like for example, if you would introduce the Cas9 gene into the plant, it now carries what is known as foreign DNA, and then it might not be allowed to be grown in certain countries. So they're trying to find ways to on a technical level circumvent that um, some of these regulations. 
all to say is that these are all layers that you could build on if you want to go more in that technical level that we do provide in our documents to kind of for you to adjust this lesson to the audience that you're that you're talking with. And like I said um, at the start, the kind of structure of these case studies is like, let's introduce the problem, let's introduce the genome editing technology, and then let's, let's look at questions or concerns um, and considerations. So here's just kind of a list of some of these key questions. Could genome editing negatively affect the plant's drought tolerance, a very beneficial trait for many regions across the globe, right? We heard at the start that um, the more, the drier the conditions that the plant grows in, the more of this toxin it, it creates. So there might be a link there. It might need those genes for its drought tolerance. So if you added those genes to combat toxicity, you might also take away its drought tolerance. That needs to be looked into. Could genome editing make the plant more vulnerable to insects and other pests? Very often the reason plants produce these chemicals is to protect themselves. So if you take them out, does this mean farmers now need to buy pesticides? Does it become more expensive for them to grow the crop? These are more the technical questions, but then you also get into questions like, will someone own these edited plants? And what about the seeds, right? This is more like economical questions, legal questions of like, okay, we make these plants. How do these farmers can, do they now have to pay to grow the plants? How's that gonna work? And also the bigger picture of like, should efforts in preventing console lie with this genome editing approach? Or should the focus be on breaking the cycle of poverty that's really at the root of those regions where Conzo is prevalent? Or maybe it's a combination of these two um, approaches that's the best way forward. So taking a step back here, like what I did today, because it's a webinar and it's very much a gun, it's, it's almost unusual for PGA to do most of the talking. So getting a bit out of my comfort zone in that sense, but what I did today is present these questions to you. And that's one way of doing this. It gets people thinking and lets them be aware of the questions. And again, the slide note of this has a lot more detail and some additional questions um, there as well. Another way of doing this is to kind of see, you know, the do now kind of start at this thinking, right? Like what are questions you would have for the scientist? Um, another thing you could do is like, now that you've gone over kind of the content, the problem at hand, as well as the, the genome editing technologies, like go back to that do now and see, do you have more questions now or do you wanna modify the questions you had? Um, and they might come up with some of these questions that are on the screen right now. Another way of, of an assignment you could think here is um, ask students, for example, to write a persuasive essay about this case study. Like um, around the question, for example, should we use, should we use genome editing to on cassava to solve this problem of conso and ask them to do some further research and maybe use these questions as kind of guiding questions. So there's, again, not just content wise, do we try and provide many ways for you to kind of adjust the lesson according to the people you're talking with, but also thinking about the assignments um, and how you engage with the material in that way. So that's really what I had to say about this specific case study. And I just want to give Dana, just because Dana's done a lot of work on this lesson as well and it's presented this lesson very often so as i'm um, trying to keep my voice alive by drinking some tea dana if you have anything you wanted to add <laughs> specifically here yes do. I do. thank you um so one of the things i was just scribbling down as you were writing is you know thinking as you were talking is um you know if you're talking to graduate students or yeah um, you know, we I, I, I talk with seventh graders about this and 12th graders and community members. Um, but, you know, some of these questions about um, IP tech transfer, the regulatory questions, you know, like these are really engaging um, questions for for the for scientists, I think. And so there's a way to to bring this conversation super high level. Um, I think at the undergraduate level too, you know, some of these, these are still will be new novel ideas. Um, and at the same time, I also, um, I was jotting down around how I remember, uh, like a, there was a cohort of PhD students that I know that went on to law school after their doctorate, you know? So there's, I think that this is a real um, gateway into a lot of different conversations and, and, and fields. Um, and the last thing I'll add is, I had an experience teaching this where I live here, um, I'm in Maine, and I was teaching at a small private school and I had 
some engaged students and some disengaged students. And uh, when I started talking about cassava and um, I mentioned one of the popular um, foods from the Congo that you can make from it called fufu. And I had like a kid look up, like a kid like raised her head for the first time in my talk and said to me after, most people don't talk to me about like this food that I have every day at home um, while I'm here in my biology class. And I was like, well, tell me more, like t t tell me more about cassava, you know, like, um, and like, tell me your expertise, right? What else do you do? What about the leaves? What about the, you know, like whatever. <laughs> um, and so I just think that as a, as teachers, we're always looking for these connections and sort of keeping our minds, um, open to what can happen, even when you're a little out of your comfort zone, you know, I know sort of, um, and to that point, the, you know, this lesson like has a short discussion about um, the brief, you know, a brief sort of primer on colonialism in the Congo, because we know that that isn't not maybe part of people's educations um, who are in this field. And so we, we, we try and scaffold these lessons to give people who are using them, the tools to succeed to do them. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Dana. Um, yeah, actually also wanted to just quickly, because Dana reminded me of something that I wanted to mention in general, which I kind of did talking about like the example of the woolly mammoth and find that hook. Um, but also like the story Dana just told about like, you know, somebody sees something they recognize, see themselves reflected in the materials can bring that spark and bring that interest, right? Um, and what, what Marnie mentioned earlier, the next case that we're gonna talk about Hawaiian honey creepers, again, it's for people to see their own culture, their own geography, however, their own community experience, however you wanna frame that in the materials um, really makes people connect with it. And it's also powerful for, to introduce others to their culture, right? To have others see that might not be familiar with it. It's this, um, idea that we've talked about like this windows and mirrors, the mirror of, of seeing yourself reflect the material, but also the window into seeing how other regions of the world or other cultures deal with, with certain things. And so um, a term that's, that's often being used around this is kind of this idea of um, place-based um, education or place-based materials where this is an exercise we've done with teachers, but I think it would also really work with students actually as I'm talking right now which is like ask them to like come up with it. We've done this with teachers of like, come up with a case study, similar setup as we've done in this lesson about something in your area, right? I mean, right now, Marnie shared the headline of the, the genetically modified mosquitoes being released in the Florida Keys. That's a great case study for Florida teachers to think about, but they could also assign that to their students. And like, you've heard this on the news. How about you write a case study around similar, um, to, because it directly impacts their lives and kind of gives that interest. Okay, so let's actually switch to honey creepers because I keep mentioning them and we haven't actually seen <laughs> what that one is about. So again, um, repeating myself here, we start with a do now, right? We start with getting people engaged from the get go. And as you can see, I, I'm, the reason I kept this in here is to just show you like the different flavors of how we think about this. So in this case, as you can see from the very first sentence here, you are a scientist. So last time we put ourselves in the shoes of somebody who was like a villager where scientists are coming to them and they, it's like, okay, what questions would you have if you were the villager? This time you're now the scientist, you have thought of a genetic solution to a problem at hand. In this case, it is a species of bird that is at risk of a danger of extinction because of avian malaria. And so the questions that we ask here, which is the second paragraph on the slide, you know that people who live on the island need to be partners in this project. How do you establish such a partnership? What is the information you need to gather from them? What information might you want to give to them? What are you looking to learn? So this is really, again, to keep thinking of the bigger picture. Science is not live in isolation, it lives in society. So what, as a scientist, you might have come up with a genetic solution and you wanna bring that to that island, to that community, but like, who else do you wanna get involved with? What are the questions you have is kind of what we wanna think about. And we'll get to some more detail of that um, as we go through this one. And so this case study, just to give you a little bit of background is about the Hawaiian honey creeper. We see an image of them here on the slide. And these birds are of huge cultural significance to the indigenous people of Hawaii. 
And this bird is at risk of extinction, partially because their habitat is shrinking due to human activity. But a big part of it, as we saw in the do now, is this um, threat of avian malaria. And so, again, as you see, the setup is very similar. Let's now look at what's the problem at hand. And so avian malaria is a disease called by parasites that infect the honeycubus via mosquito bites. And the really interesting thing here is that mosquitoes are relatively speaking new to Hawaii. They were only introduced in about the 1800s um, to the islands. And so because of that, these Hawaiian honeycubus do not really have any natural defense against either the mosquitoes or the parasites that cause malaria. And that's why this is so uh, threatening to this species. And so the honeycubus are forced to live at higher altitudes because it's too cold there for the mosquitoes to survive. So this is kind of a survival strategy they have um, adapted. However, for their food resources, honeycreepers need to travel into the valleys, which again puts them at risk of malaria infection because that's where the mosquitoes live. And as average temperatures are rising in Hawaii, these mosquitoes kind of live at higher and higher altitudes. So it again brings a bigger and bigger threat to the Hawaiian honeycreepers. And so taking a, just a, a quick step back here, I just wanted to highlight here like, when you see the title of our lesson and think about our lesson, the first thing is like, oh, this goes into a genetics class, right? And that's a great fit. Like if you're talking about genome editing to your materials, these case studies are a way to bring that into li to life in a way of like, how does it live in society? What are the questions we're thinking about? Kind of all the things we've already talked about. But I mean, here you can also see, and, and, and Dana also already touched upon this, like, you know, there's regulation and law you can think about. There's also the angle here about ecosystems, right? Um, we're thinking of like, how do all these species interact with each other? Climate change, average temperatures are increasing. Here we see a consequence that might not be directly in the front of people's minds, right? Climate change, we think of things getting warmer and sea levels rising, but let's look at a very specific case of how that might affect this very specific species of bird. So really to encourage people to think beyond maybe a genetics class to include some of these conversations and some of these lessons. So what is the, again, same layout, what is the genetic technology that's being introduced? I won't go into too much detail, but um, really there's many genome editing when it comes to like mosquitoes and combating the diseases they can transmit. Uh, we focus on kind of two broad ones here. One of them is like, we could introduce a genetic trait that will wipe out the mosquito population. No more mosquitoes means they no longer transmit avian malaria. That could help these birds. Or we could introduce a genetic trait that prevents a mosquito from carrying the malaria parasite. So mosquitoes are still going to be there. So again, you can think of big ecosystems. You know, do you want to wipe out an entire species of mosquitoes, or do you might want to keep them around? There's pros and cons to either one of those. Um, so we keep the mosquitoes, but they can no longer transmit the parasite that causes malaria. So the additional kind of technological point we add here is this, based on this idea of like, well, if I make these mosquitoes that have my genetic trait of interest and I release them into the wild, and they made with wild mosquitoes, that trait, if you look through the generations, doesn't spread very far, um, very broadly, I should say, in the population. And so what researchers have looked at is a tool called a gene drive, which basically ensures that that trait that I'm interested to spread in the wild population um, is uh, passed at basically 100% to offspring. And so as you can see from the schematic, now we spread this much more broadly in the mosquito population through the generations and actually in this specific schematic, all the offspring in that final generation now have that genetic trait. And again, um, it's the same with the cassava. For many audiences, this is maybe where I'll stop talking about the details, but I can imagine that for many of you, you might wanna talk about more detail on um, how do gene drives work? What exactly are these traits? And so, first of all, there's a lot of resources out there. If you, for example, type gene drive into YouTube, many, cool like animations that explain that. We ourselves in this lesson, if you um, go to the lesson document, we have a supplemental slide at the end that hopefully as you can see from this schematic goes into more detail of how these gene drives work. And the slide note that goes with this, I think it's about a page long, goes into kind of the molecular details of the gene drive, but also the molecular details of these two traits that I talked about here, right? How does that work? Like what is the molecular mechanism behind wiping out these mosquitoes as well as, or preventing mosquitoes from carrying the malaria parasites. So again, we're trying to provide people with the tools to adjust the lesson to where the level of detail they would like to get into and that works with their, um, their audience. 
Okay, and the same as with the last case study, we add, we finish with major questions and considerations. Some are on the slide. There's a lot in the slide notes. I've gone over how you can use them in various ways. Um, the one I wanted to point out here because it nicely also links to another activity that we have is the final questionnaire. Who are the key people to involve in the decision about whether to use a genome editing approach? So this is something that we've mentioned throughout today. It's like this idea of broadening the concept of expertise. So let me actually go to the case study. Um, so case studies are a tool we often use to kind of get people thinking about different scenarios um, around different topics. So put yourself in the shoes of somebody uh, that is involved in a certain topic, very broadly speaking, and think from their experience. And we generally ask you to put yourself in different people's shoes around the scenario to really look at all the different angles, or at least a variety of angles. And so in our um, genome editing and CRISPR lesson, we have a very specific set of case studies that have a general prompt of you are an elected official and you need to make an informed recognition about the problem at hand. Read your assigned topic, ask yourself, what else do I need to know and who should I ask? And one of the topics that is in our CRISPR lesson is should genetically modified mosquitoes be released into the environment to combat the Zika virus? Very current. There are elected officials in Florida who have had to make these decisions and have had to think about these things. Who would you ask, right? And this is really about what we mentioned earlier, this, this idea of of broadening the idea of expertise. Very often when we start talking about genetic technologies in society, the language people use, the language students use is like, the scientists are the experts and then there is the other people that are somehow involved. We are trying to kind of shift that a bit to recognize that, no, there are multiple experts you need to be involving in that conversation. Definitely the scientist who maybe made the genetically modified mosquitoes needs to be part of that and is an expert in that. But you probably want to talk with local expertise on where do these mosquitoes live. Um, in this case, we're talking Zika virus. Um, you might want to talk an expert on the virus, a doctor who's had patients, a patient who themselves suffered from Zika. You might want to talk with legal people, sorry, I don't know the exact terms for that, that might know the laws about releasing genetically modified organisms into the environment. If you as an ex official want to hold a referendum, which is what they did in Florida Keys, um, you might want to think of talking about educational experts on releasing materials that can inform the public as they're trying to give an informed opinion on should we do this in this community or not. And so lots of different ways of thinking about this and broadening this idea of like, how do we all work together as these scientific um, advances move into society? And so that was me on the second case study. Dana, do you have anything you would like to add on the... Hawaiian honeycreepers or just the conversation in general? I was just looking up the project in the on uh, Martha's Vineyard about the ticks, actually. That's in um, a journal that I'm, I'm, I almost have the link. Um, because again, there are lots of um, stories, I think, that are in people's backyards. And again, this is another one that is very flexible in terms of graduate level scientific discussion or community visit to your local library. Um, we, PG Ed has sort of done both um, of those and everything in between. And, um, you know, this is a big topic. You know, you hear, you hear a lot of talks. Some, I mean, back in the before times when I felt like I went to places and God, conferences, you know, there's always this and we need to do more talking about this, right? We've got to, you know, have community input. And um, we have found like this, these sort of stories and materials can really be like part of that, um, part of that actual sort of work. I'm going to look for my link though, but I'm going to stop here. I think we do have a few other things to talk about in terms of how we develop this lesson though, right, Nadine? Oh, I was uh, about to wrap up, so feel free oh. to add <laughs> if you had further. Uh, well, I'm just thinking about how it, it, we, um, we, it turned out, needed help with this lesson that we didn't even know we needed. <laughs> Do you want to tell this story about the creepers that we, the... Oh, yeah. Um, when it comes to, you know, 
doing this type of work, you need to get comfortable with making mistakes. Um, Cause it's going to happen. Right. I mean, especially, so for me personally, I'll try not to make this too long because I also want to keep an eye on the clock and be respectful of that. We have a Q and a, but like I, my expertise from a research point of view, if we really want to talk details is like studying meiosis in budding yeast and chromosome dynamics in mammalian cells. That is like where, you know, I can go in depth and detail. Doing this work means a much broader approach where I'll have to be comfortable with not being an expert, obviously on every, I mean, look at this lesson. It talks from all these different species, different denial technologies, but also just broadly European colonialism, laws around GMO, like it goes very broad. Um, and that means that I cannot be an expert on everything. I have to be comfortable with that, but also it means I'll make mistakes sometimes. And one of the mistakes I made is when we initially launched this lesson and we announced it on Twitter, I was like, oh, I'll include a nice picture of the Hawaiian honeycomb because they're such beautiful birds. Little did I know that the picture I picked, although it was assigned on Google as being a Hawaiian honeycreeper, always be very careful to double check your resources, was not a Hawaiian honeycreeper. I cannot remember. It is of the honeycreeper family, but not from Hawaii. And that was very kindly pointed out to me by a Hawaiian native who is actually, a, a, we're big fans of him and we collaborate with him on, on other things, but it kind of deepened our relationship because he pointed out on Twitter saying like, wonderful that you include this in your material, but that image that you used right there is not an Hawaiian honeycomber. So you can imagine initially I was mortified and like, oh gosh, because Twitter, right, it's out there in the world. Um, but it actually was a very friendly conversation. I made sure to find a correct picture. And, and, and that's just an example of like, um, first of all, you know, you're going to make mistakes, be comfortable with that. It's all about how you respond to them. Um, I'm not saying that my, I, I'm like the example of how you sort of respond to them, but just be comfortable that's going to happen but also and again highlight the importance of having various voices as you're even thinking about your educational material like what martin said at the very start about having florcy there to really shift this product and think about the bigger picture of like how do these technologies affect the people living on the lands like the indigenous people affected by bringing these technologies to where they are right that was a a, a thing we wouldn't have necessarily thought about had we not had her expertise on that. And in this case, the expertise of somebody living on Hawaii, being very familiar with that really broadened and enriched our lesson. And I think that's something to think about, like find the other person in your department that might know a bit more on a certain topic. And you could even co-teach, you know, there's a lot of ways we encourage people to think about uh, teaching the lesson in different classes. And so I really want to uh, quickly wrap up here because I want to go into the Q&A and the half hour after where I'm sure we can talk about a lot of these other things. So very briefly, uh, next step action items. Uh, we are planning more webinars. We're still working around scheduling them as everybody's schedules right now are in between online, at home, in person. So there's a bit of a, but we are planning on having more of these webinars. Um, another thing that I'm very excited about is that we are working on putting together smaller interactive workshops like I said, we're all about discussing. So this is very unnatural for me to just have been talking at you. Um, and so these workshops will have the aim of having a smaller group together to go more into depth on a lot of the strategies, the topics, things like that. And we are aiming to launch this in the fall. So please keep an eye out for those. Um, very quickly in the chat, we will share a link to our Slack community that we've set up. Um, really it's to bring people together for to continue the conversation beyond just this hour, hour and a half we have with you. But also there are people in this community right now here that I'm sure are doing projects in different ways, reaching out to the general public. And so I want to just give people space to interact with each other. You might learn from each other. What wanna, you know, have another speaker at your event. And this is a way or a place where you can kind of gather that. So that link should be shared. We also have uh, a survey about today's webinar. Your input has been so helpful and important to us as these webinars have been progressing to kind of make sure we hit on the points that you're looking for. And so please, please, please fill out the survey because it's going to help us so much in the future. And I think we might also be sharing an interest survey, which is really about this collaboration project in general, as we're thinking about creating these workshops, future webinars, just to hear your thoughts and ideas. And I will stop there because it's later than I was hoping it to be. But to say thank you today for listening, uh, we'll switch to q and I'll first ask Jessica to stop the recording so we can have our Q&A um, after that. Thank you. <laughs>